Good evening. My name is Matthew Ogden. Uh, tonight is July 26th, 2013, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special event uh, which we are going to be holding here tonight. You're joining us for our weekly webcast on LaRouchePack.com featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, which happens every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, however, joining me tonight in the studio, in addition to Leandra Bernstein, is the entire LaRouche Pack Policy Committee, all six members from all around the United States. So our format will be somewhat special tonight. Uh, we will be taking questions from uh, those who are joining us in the studio, not only Leandra Bernstein, and I will be presenting a question also, but also from the various members of the LaRouche Pack Policy Committee. So, without further ado, I would like to get tonight's proceedings underway by asking Leandra Bernstein to be the first to come to the podium to pose the first question. Thank you. Now, this is a question which is a timely question about the period of time coming upon us when the Congress is scheduled to recess for their their August uh, their August break time in their district. Now that that period is marked by a complete change in tide in Washington D.C. as a result of what the LaRouche Pack has been doing over the course of many years in pushing the issue of Glass Steagall, which has now finally gotten a real serious head of steam where it's not only all over the press, but, uh, but hearings in Congress uh, are being held on the issue of, for example, Senate Banking Committee. Should bank holding companies be allowed to own power plants, pipelines, warehouses, and power plants, uh, sorry, et cetera? And, uh, and then there, there, also, there was also the, um, the Dear Colleague letter written by, uh, by Marcy Kaptur, the lead sponsor of H.R. 129, which finally put out, uh, which finally issued the request to all of the members of the House of Representatives to add their names to, pa to pass Glass-Steagall. Now, it's, we're also, this time vacuum is also what has often been referred to as the guns of August, where Congress is not in session, and with uh, tensions in the Middle East being as they are now, and Obama seemingly hell-bent on uh, getting a full-fledged war started in Syria, uh, it's, it's a questionable time frame in terms of what will happen in Europe. There's also been discussions, rumblings behind the scenes about uh, an oncoming an oncoming breakout crisis, a worsening European uh, financial crisis. And so that's the period that we're entering into. So while we have an excellent fight going on putting through Glass-Steagall, we're entering a, a sort of vacuous period. So if you could, if you could address what what is what is coming up at the end of this coming week what we can do to change that potential outcome I'm trying to figure out a formula that's going to tell you what the result is going to be give up on that one because anyone who's any good is going to be fighting up to the last minute and therefore you cannot predict what is going to happen what you have to do is you have to make it happen, which means that you never quit. You don't stop. You don't, you don't stop on one thing said. You keep coming, you keep coming, you keep coming. You never stop coming until the last bell has rung. And that's the way we'll go at it. Now, the thing is not so simple as it might seem, nor is it as complicated in other ways as it might seem. We are right, and they are wrong, and that's important. Like the development in Detroit recently is an example of that. 
this has changed the character of the situation. Because now you have a fear, a real fear, of what this monstrosity is. See, people, you remember, you, it's not that long ago, you can remember that people would give in because they said, we're not going to risk it this time. People, members of Congress, we're not going to take a chance on voting for this this time. It's not our time. Huh? No, this is the last chance. This is not a, a time that might or might not work. This is the last chance. And more and more people around the world know that. It's that for Europe. What we're headed for, and there will never be a, a political uh, solution on the other side, never. This thing is either win all the way or go down all the way. This is the last chance. Now, a point, all people are talking about the options. They're just actually either stupid or they're trying to deceive people because there are no options. The general breakdown crisis of everything is already underway. And without Glass-Steagall being enacted, there is no solution. Nobody has a solution. Look, this thing, this system is so bankrupt, it has no validity. No one has any validity. And all they have to have is the whisper that this ain't working, or it's going down, or it has no solution. You get a general panic. So you're on the edge of general panic. So what we have to do is not how, just how many votes we can stimulate, how, what ratio of votes. We're going all the way. We're going all the way to victory because there is no survival without the victory of the cause we're pushing. There's no survival of civilization without the cause we're pushing. It's not possible. This place is hopelessly bankrupt. There is nothing but bankruptcy in there. We don't have industries anymore. When did we last have an industry? We don't have farming to speak of anymore. And people are swallowing gasoline or something instead of food, if they can get it. So this is, this is a time where either we are able, by doing what we're supposed to do, to play a crucial role, a catalytic role, but also a direct role, in causing this thing, Glass-Steagall, to run through. There is nothing significant that is likely to happen on the good side without Glass-Steagall. A Glass-Steagall victory is the only chance for the survival of civilization. Otherwise, there is no civilized solution. And one of those non-solutions is nuclear, thermal nuclear power, thermal nuclear fusion, as a weapon. And that's what's added. That's why the chi China is threatened now. China is threatened. Why? Because they, most the troops that the United States has, and similar kinds of things it has, they're not adequate to cover both China and these, the present uh, area. They can't do it. It's not possible. What they can do is they can threaten China, which is what they've done. You threaten China, and you seem to move your forces in the direction of China, away from the United States and so forth. But that is not going to happen. Whatever they move the forces are, forget it. We're talking about thermonuclear war. And thermonuclear war starts in some parts of the planet and spreads throughout the rest of the planet. You're talking about an extermination war, not a war in the ordinary sense. And therefore, the point is, we have to win. There is no alternative to winning. There's no option to re return to if you don't win. And you see from the Detroit, Detroit experience exactly where this thing stands. And you see how, how the reaction against what was being done in Detroit is now already in motion. It doesn't mean it's been victorious by any means, but it means the action has started. So we're now in a war. You cannot predict the outcome of a war, as MacArthur would have told you in World War I and World War II. You can never predict the outcome of a major war. You have to win it. And anyone who thinks you can gamble or bet is an idiot. 
the only thing you can do with major war is win it or lose it. And losing it is not a comfortable effect. Now, um, this is a question which has come in from uh, some institutional circles uh, inside Washington, D.C. Uh, I will just read the question as it was written. Mr. LaRouche, the Egyptian situation has reached a critical juncture, and we would like your assessment. There are two distinct and opposing views of the recent events in Egypt. In one camp, the actions by the Egyptian army are seen as a legitimate response to a popular demand for a fundamental change in policy, which President Morsi had rejected. When at least 10 million Egyptians took, took to the streets after submitting over 20 million signatures on a petition calling for early elections, the army acted on behalf of the people. Their action was legitimate. The other camp views the action by General al-Sisi as an illegal military coup. In the past several days, ministers of the new interim government have invoked a Nasserite, Nasserite message by declaring that they reject austerity and will develop policies leading to job creation and economic development. The interim government has set a short timetable to revise the Constitution and hold elections. They have announced that no parties, even the Muslim Brotherhood parties, will be excluded. Please give us your assessment and policy options. Well, Egypt is a very important country. Uh, since uh, the Confederate, ex-Confederate soldiers of the, uh, of the army uh, created a military force for Egypt, uh, which was many other things. So for even to this day, the, all these years passed, 150 years or so passed, and still the aftermath of the U.S. Civil War is radiating around the world in various ways. And in this process, and we've had the both sides are still going at this thing. So that's what the situation is. And we, we, we have every chance of uh, promoting this. And what we've seen happen today in, in Egypt, um, that itself, look, you have the, some multi-religious business, Christian as well as Muslim. And they're all together working together with the military force to prevent the kind of chaos which, ah, did you ever hear about a 9-11 uh, business? Do you realize that the, one of the big factors in this process is 9-11? And that 9-11, which is about to explode anyway now, because it's, you can no longer hold back on 9-11, the truth. 9-11 was done by the British Empire, the British agency, which is a Saudi British agency, military agency, and the Saudi Kingdom. They are the ones who ran 9-11. No other agency ran 9-11. It was the Anglo-Saudi operation from beginning to end in great detail. We've had the former President Bush, two terms, was an accomplice, a leading accomplice in this. He wasn't the architect. He hasn't got the brains to know where his feet from his head. But he's the guilty person. Obama has continued that process. He's guilty. He's also a part of fomenting the Muslim issue. So therefore, and at the same time, this thing is all going on the direction of Thermonuclear War. If there is a war, a major war, it's Thermonuclear. So now, what you've seen in the way in which Egypt has reacted to the threats from one faction, which has been conspiring to try to overthrow the government. Well, they did an excellent job. They unified all the healthy elements, essentially all the elements of Egypt, together to prevent this new chaos. 
Now, the, there's two aspects to this. There's the Egyptian aspect is, is, as such. There's also the aspect of nations like the United States. Because these outside nations do have an influence in determining what the result is going to be in terms of this election process itself. It can suddenly explode. The Egyptian military and others are well aware of that and have taken specific precautions against it. But we have a chance of winning. But we cannot be content with the victory in Egypt for peace, nor can anything else. We have to be alert on all fronts. There otherwise is no hope that we can promote anyone. We just have to contribute our part to this process. This is not a predetermined result. This is a result that we have to actively be involved in, not by putting ourselves as troops on the ground, but in, in under, putting support for a peaceful solution for the present situation. All right. Now, I believe, is the time when we unleash the policy committee to ask you some pressing questions. And uh, to begin with the questions, I'd like for Bill Roberts to come up to the podium. Uh, for those of our viewers who don't know, Bill Roberts ran uh, in the 2012 election in Michigan's 11th district, and he's also been a key fighter for the really, you could say, the salvation of Detroit and the Midwest region, uh, going back to, uh, to the Emergency Recovery Act, dealing with the auto sector in 2005 through 2007, and even before that. So I'd like Bill to come up. I'd like to raise the Detroit question. Um, because, Lynn, I think <clears throat> while, while you're right that this situation that Detroit's going through is sufficiently shocking for people, and I know from the past week of, of work in, in the Congress, it has caused many people to take much more seriously uh, the role that we have been playing in crusading for a reinstatement of, uh, of Glass-Steagall. And to see that the situation that Detroit is being faced with uh, and the demands that are being made to screw the population is the direction that the rest of this country is going. But at the same time, there is a dangerous divide and conquer game being played at the same time. And this, <clears throat> this becomes apparent uh, through discussion, perhaps with, with neighbors, from uh, a survey of, of the, the uh, uh, business weeklies, and how, and how the situation in Detroit is being discussed. Because one of the lines out there that's very nasty is that, well, this is just, this is just a Detroit crisis. It's, it's Detroit. Uh, they have to learn to manage themselves. This is a mismanagement corruption problem. And then, and then the, on the other side, there's this, well, uh, Detroit, this, this bankruptcy process is just the beginning of a, of a turnaround, and, and, and Detroit will, will, will come out of this. Don't, don't overreact. Don't panic. Um, and I, I, think, I think there's a way in which um, this this uh, the, the way in which the, the population could uh, would be thinking about this situation is very important because one of the things that happens in a crisis management type of situation is the oligarchy will say, <clears throat> well, this is an unprecedented situation. We have to deal with unprecedented solutions, which means forget the Constitution. Uh, however, I think that this could be a situation where, in particular, our solution, the Hamiltonian credit system, and the way that works can actually be used to unify uh, the, the population 
around the sense that what this means now is that the whole nation must develop together. If you could address that, please. We have to have a concept. It's not just a solution. We have to think of a, of a concept that's involved here. Look, what is the situation of the United States in terms of its economic development over the period, well, say, the uh, last really effective presidency uh, went down? What had happened, particularly with the two terms of the Bush family and this latest phenomenon, is that the economy of the United States virtually does not exist. And that's true in the case of the auto industry in particular, which is this, the center of this whole thing with Detroit, is the auto industry. And it's not just the auto industry in Michigan, nor is it in the northern states around Michigan. It goes all the way through the entire system, north, south, east, and west. And the U.S. economy does no longer function. And there is no hope for this nation under the present conditions unless we change those conditions radically. Hmm? Therefore, we have, we, have, we have, no, have lost the auto industry. Do you know how important the auto industry was? Do you know how important back in 2005 and so forth and five when we fought to try to save the auto industry? And I was playing a leading part in that fight. Do you realize what happened when the auto industry went down? Do you realize we no longer are a nation capable of meeting our own needs? Now look, then look at the food supply. What's the food supply of the United States? How part, parts of the farm area work? Nothing works, especially since George W. Bush became a president and 9-11 was put into effect. Remember, it was about three days into the new year that I told the certain family that this was going to happen. It happened as I forecast. And when, I was, when it was breaking out, the actual airstrikes were breaking out, I was on the scene with a tel television and so forth network, and we went blow by blow with this thing. And as I went through that thing, by the time we started the discussion on the radio, on the radio television connection, and the time it came to a close, I knew the entire story. I couldn't prove parts of it, but I knew it. This was done against the United States with the complicity of the Bush administration, who didn't, author, didn't initiate it. It was initiated by the Saudi Kingdom and by the British Empire, both the British monarchy and by the uh, f military supply operation, which was a joint Saudi-British oper uh, operation. And so since that point, there has been a disintegration throughout Europe and throughout the, the United States and other parts of the world. We no longer have a sustainable economy. What we have is the possibility, with, a, with special efforts, to revive the economy. Now, what we're going to have to do, now we've got some people in Detroit, for example. They're unemployed, essentially. There are a few of them left on the other odd industries that they fled into as machine tools, specialists, and so forth. What we're going to do, we're not going to lose this business with China. We're not going to lose the auto industry to China. What we're going to do is create a new industry based on the core of, this, of the skilled people who can play a key leading part in assembling a replacement for what used to be called the, the auto industry. The real name for the auto industry, as it was since World War II, uh, is the machine tool industry. That's its character. So our job is, in the case of Detroit, we can't, you cannot solve this economic problem by sitting there or by following some, but some politician's recipes, especially a current president's recipes. Huh? What we can do is seize control of the situation. Through, only through Glass-Steagall can we save the United States. Otherwise, the United States is doomed. Without Glass-Steagall, because there is no agriculture, there is no machine tool uh, system, there is no labor 
production of any significance? That's it. So therefore, unless we get Glass-Steagall in, we will not be able to make an immediate change from the kind of economy on which we're operating now, which is a hopeless failure, by changing quickly to bring agriculture back, to build up the water system that we need for, for feeding our people. All these things depend upon Glass-Steagall. Not just Glass-Steagall itself, but an expanded version of Glass-Steagall. And therefore, the issue is, unless we can seize the, the hands of power in the United States and organize the government to behave like the government, not like it's been doing recently, and go in there and put Glass-Steagall into effect quickly, and having done that, we're going to have to, in addition to Glass-Steagall, we're going to have to create a credit system to supplement Glass-Steagall in order to finance the things that have to be built up in terms of, of production, which are needed to restore this nation. And without those actions, there's no hope. You had, don't have a chance. There is no other option. Grab the United States, put it back to business as best you can, and use some innovation but above all, apply Glass-Steagall as I know how to do it. And some other people also know. And the very fact that we restore the confidence of the people in their own nation, that is of the United States, by taking immediate action, which means large amounts of fundraising and fund contributions to get the farming and industry back going immediately. We have to have, just as Roosevelt did during the period of the onset of the Depression, his, his first years, we had people, we put them to work. They weren't really producing anything. They were sticking there with shovels and picks and so forth out of the streets. They weren't really producing things, but they were there. And they had a job. And they had the beginnings of a family income. And they had a future. And that's what Roosevelt gave them. Gave them. And that's what we now have to give the people of the United States. We cannot give them much because the friends of the Bush family have stolen to, so much there's not much left for real people. But we can restart the process of production. Restart that. And that we can do. And that we must do. Without Glass-Steagall, we cannot do it. So the lives of the people of the United States depend upon Glass-Steagall. And Glass-Steagall can only be delivered by Glass-Steagall plus. And Glass-Steagall means plus that we're going to take the junk that is junk, we're going to cancel it. Most of this banking crap is worthless. There's no value in it. So why are we continuing to bail it out in a hyperinflationary rate? We don't need it. Put the thing through processing. And you will find that when you go through the paperwork, that all these banking systems, the Wall Street crowd, that all of them, how much of these th things they claim they own are actually real? I don't know if they could come out with a penny of it for, for, for a giant. Um, so therefore, the point is we have to restore the United States, get rid of this crap, and do what Franklin Roosevelt did is going to be more difficult than what Franklin Roosevelt faced in his time. But the principle is we've got to do it. And that, that's the answer. We've got to do it and get the message across to the people. That's the only thing. There is no other chance. The fact, forget this Republican nonsense. They're just wolves trying to find a place to bark in. But that's the answer. And there is no other answer. All right. Well, I'd like to ask Keisha Rogers to come up for the next question. And Keisha, as you all should know, uh, ran in the 2010 and 2012 congressional uh, campaigns in Texas, in the 22nd district in Texas. And for those who might not remember it, she also ran a campaign in 2006 on the platform of Out of the Bushes and Into the Future. Uh, but in her inner campaigning uh, and her successful, uh, successfully receiving the Democratic nomination 2010 and 2012, uh, the crux of her campaign uh, was 
on impeaching Obama, saving NASA, and I'd like her to ask the next question. Thank you. So I would like to continue on the question of the influence of the Bushes, and particularly in Texas, because what we've seen, and I have participated in the crushing of the Bushes and their intervention into Texas for quite some time, as Leandra just said, running back in 2006 for the uh, out of the Bushes for the Democratic Party state chairmanship, and going after Tom DeLay and the entire Bush faction that has been prominent in Texas. We've seen the Bush faction can be looked at from the standpoint of where this has led to since really the remarks of Kennedy and what Kennedy intended and what he actually developed in his speech given in Houston, Texas at Rice University and how that was destroyed, that intention, what was actually intended for a mission and a purpose for the nation, which was done right in Texas, was actually later destroyed by what the Bushes represented, the shutdown of industry, the shutdown of our agriculture, as we're still seeing today, the intervention into the Democratic Party, and particularly having George Bush Sr. come in into Texas and use Texas as the forefront of all of his evil pro policies of what he would do to later on push for what would later become the dismantling of our manned space program, what we've seen with the collapse in agriculture. And we've seen that the population has had a sense of mission under Kennedy, and that was real well defined what Kennedy's mission was with the Apollo mission, with the manned space program, which had a strong effect in Texas. And now what we're seeing is that with the policies of the Bushes and continuing under Obama, that mission has been lost and that, that fight that people once had that was identified under Kennedy, who was killed in Dallas, Texas, has been lost. And so you see that the capitulation to this evil, which is continued from George Bush Sr. to George Bush Jr. to Barack Obama, has really characterized an unwillingness in the population to fight, to continue a mission that they, to, to, to understand that what is at stake right now is the lives of every single American citizen if we don't shut down this President Obama, but most importantly, shut down the evil empire, not just starting with the Bushes, but actually starting with the Queen and the intention that has been carried out under the under the Bushes and also now under Barack Obama. And you're looking at the situation where unless we get people to break with that and to really identify that the mission has been lost and their understanding of what's at stake can only be can only be taken up from the standpoint that we have to give people a sense of what does it mean to fight. So I, I would like to ask you, looking at what Kennedy had intended and where we are and what his purpose in really giving and defining a mission for mankind and how that has been rejected by society today, how do we actually define that purpose and that reason that people must understand that they have to fight to live again? Well, the, the assassination of Kennedy was obviously motivated by people inside the United States. And it was very large people in terms of influence. And they were all the people who actually, the issue, key issue there at that moment was that the president was opposing a war in Indochina. What they, the issue was Indochina. 
the president was opposing the war in Indochina. D uh, Douglas MacArthur, the most senior general that the United States has seen in the 20th century, was firmly opposing it. Opposing it. He was opposing all of these policies. Well, he and Eisenhower died a few years later after Kennedy's death. And we never got the United States back again. We had this clown from California, a governor there, who played as the dog who was going to allow the justification and defense of the assassins of President Kennedy. That war in Indochina, which MacArthur had warned against and said the United States must not be involved in that war. And he was right. He knew it. He understood it as very few people did. They went ahead with that war. It went on for about 10 years. And it became the birthplace of many other wars which are totally unnecessary. And the Max, as a matter of fact, worse than stupid. So what happened? There has not been a government of the United States which is worth shucks in terms of its ability to deal with this problem. I mean, some people were, some presidents were not bad presidents. But as I had learned on the SDI, SDI was my policy. I orchestrated it internationally. And the president supported it. But then all the clowns voted against it in support of the British. And we lost everything. We got George H. W. Bush, stupid Bush, but mean, nasties, lousy. Huh? Then we got it. We got that later, two terms under his son, who was a vicious little pig, not worth anything. And the worst evils that were done against the United States were done under George, second George Bush, George W. Bush, second year, second term. He did the most evil things, but he wasn't really the author of these evil things. He's an evil person, but he wasn't that bright to really do evil things evilly. We had other people, who, the clowns, who ran him in office. We have now this other clown who is not even really the president. He may be the president in name, legally, but he's not, a, he's not running this government. This president does not run the United States government. It's run by a committee of private and other interests which are running all of these operations. Like the Snowden case is, is typical, is, is a window of peeking into exactly what this government is. If you look at what has happened to the United States government uh, since the second, uh, the, the uh, George Bush Jr. on his two terms, you, you know exactly what, what happened when it started. It started with cancellation of guess what? Glass Steagall. The operation to cancel Glass Steagall occurred then in the last days, essentially, in the course of the last period of Bill Clinton. And we never got our government back since that time. We'd lost control of the government largely before with the killing of Kennedy, but we never got the government back to control the government. And what's re being revealed moment by moment, practically now, across the waters, the Atlantic Ocean, is exactly that. We do not have our own government. Private and other interests off the, off the record have that under control. You see that. The, record, the evidence is all over the place. The Snowden case is, is actually a ref reflection of this kind of corruption. And the only way we're going to get our government back is take it back. And the only way you can take it back is by the included means of a victory for Glass-Steagall. But it's going to be a make-up time. Somebody owes the American people a great deal. 
They could never pay it back, but they could pay for it. Okay, I'd like to ask Rachel Brown to ask the next, next question. And Rachel Brown ran against uh, Barney Frank famously in the 2010 congressional campaign, and she ran again in 2012. And while she was not victorious over Barney Frank in that election, I must say that the campaign she ran on to reinstate Glass-Steagall has, is still a winner, and Barney is still a loser. <laughs> So, uh, so with that, I'd like to ask Rachel to come up to ask a question. Well, I represent a region of the country which has a problem with British royalty. So I'll just put that out there, that I think a growing part of the American population has a sense that we should no longer have a ruling oligarchy. And this includes Wall Street, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and everything that goes along with that. But I would like to ask, uh, in a sense, a follow-up for what, what Bill brought up, because as you mentioned, it does apply to the entire nation. But the fact that you did say in 2005 that if we let the machine tool capacity in the U.S. auto industry be lost and not retool it around another high technology mission, we would quickly, Detroit would quickly become a third world nation, and that's, that's what we see occurring. So I'd like to ask, in light of, uh, as you mentioned, the complete breakdown of, of the national economy today, how still can we regain this high technology orientation for our badly needing workforce? Well, it's not really a big secret because I knew all of this was going to happen as a result of what happened with the auto, auto industry. That was everything we had. We were in the middle of this thing. We had every aspect of this we went through. I mean, we had, we had the mightiest production capability the world had ever seen, which came out of World War II and out of the auto and related industries in the wartime. We had a great capability. Truman began to rip the thing apart as soon as he was president, just right from the beginning. And similar kinds of things, of things happened. But we still had a great industry. And it was destroyed. It was destroyed, first of all, by the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. It was destroyed in another pulse by the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Huh? Same thing. It dribbled away over the course of the 19, 1990s. It dribbled away completely as we went into the year 2000 with, plastic, with the operation in, of the Bushes and 9-11. That was the destruction of the United States. Then what happened to agriculture, the food supply, First, the first to start out, they run, run down the food, the water level, the water supplies. And they use a, just, they're draining the bottom of the, of the water supply in the middle states. They never, they never fix that. They keep that, that stupid policy on, in, on effect. And then the time came when the Great Plains area could no longer bring water to the surface to maintain the agriculture. Then we had a case of California. California was the greatest agricultural effort we had. And they destroyed that too. We had, a, we had the means of dealing with that, which Kennedy was going, the Kennedy machine was going for. The WAPA, the greatest water system ever conceived by mankind so far. We have a bigger potential right now. But that was the biggest uh, water project that mankind ever had or saw, or saw to have. We've been virtually destroyed. And therefore, what we need is, and this is where, you know, in Massachusetts in particular, you had, you had a, uh, 
well, I had my problems with them, but we did have a, a, a productive industry. We had it from all the way through. I was ex you know, exposed to this through my entire life, the New England industry, manufacturing industry, and agriculture. They played a key part in the, launching the, the uh, effectively planning of things in the space. Ma Massachusetts was a center of this in the space program in terms of developing for the for the, the, this, uh, this process. And we don't have that anymore. And the only thing we can do is we can take a new initiative, as I said, do what Franklin Roosevelt did, and take with the first thing you've got to do is save the morale and inspiration of the U.S. population. That's the first thing. That's our job. And that's what we've got to focus on. Focus on the recovery. If you want to focus on, on the difficult things, you get nowhere. Focus on one thing, as Kennedy did. Focus on the recovery. Don't talk about the bad things. Re identify them and say quickly, we're going to cu cut that out. You've got to focus on launching the recovery from the first moment that you get power. You've got to mobilize the people on the streets to get into some kind of work immediately to protect them and their rights, the rights to, you know, to security. Do that immediately, because the, what your real weapon is lies in the will of the American people, of the U.S. population. If they suddenly, after going through all this hell for all these decades of treason against the United States, if they suddenly see that things are really changing, really going to change, they will mobilize and we can save our nation. And you have a characteristic in Massachusetts and New England generally, you have Pennsylvania, which is also a state that's been destroyed in recent times. You've got the whole food supply of the Middle West and elsewhere, the food supply of, of, Texas, of Arizona, uh, not Arizona, uh, 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 in uh, California. California was the major food supply of the nation. What was it now? So therefore, the simple thing, you take all these things that have been collapsing. The minute Glass-Steagall is voted up, we've got to move. And we've got to move to reverse all these things. Not necessarily doing what we had stopped doing before, but something which implicitly is equivalent. For the next question, I'd like Dave Christie to come up to the podium. And Dave Christie ran for Congress in the 2012 uh, election campaign in Washington. And it is my view, and I'm sure the view of many of our supporters from that neck of the woods, that the activities of Dave Christie and the LaRouche Pact generally in that region are certainly responsible for uh, the the showing of of conscience by a certain senator who recently co-sponsored the Glass-Steagall restoration, Maria Cantwell. Uh, he's also in the belly of the beast when it comes to the environmentalist movement, and has continually campaigned for a for the uh, the notion of man that is very different from an environmentalist beast. So, like Christy, come up. Okay, so Lynn, actually, that's somewhat of a, uh, a lead-in. Um, what I want to ask is on the question of, you know, how to actually bring the nation together, and particularly on the, the notion of so-called bipartisanship. Um, <clears throat> just and reflections about Washington State. It's a it's a fairly unique place, um, and I don't just mean geog uh, geographically, although it is unique to have uh, 
temperate rainforest on one side of the state and a high desert on the other side of the state. But I think politically is where it gets very, uh, very um, distinct. And, you know, in a certain way, I was just reflecting on it that, you know, Washington state basically didn't exist until FDR. And uh, I mean, it, it was around, of course, but in terms of what's, what Seattle represents, the, the region as a whole, really came into its modern day existence around that time. And, you know, you look at the Grand Coulee Dam, you, uh, Eastern Washington, the, the whole Columbia plans around the Columbia River Basin project, uh, Bonneville Power, that fed into the aluminum industry, which created the conditions for Boeing and the shipbuilding and so forth. And it was another extension of the, the arsenal of democracy by which we won World War II. Now, the attack on the nation in general, but, but out there, the attack was real, particularly with the Green Agenda coming in in the late 60s, um, and began a demoralization process where, uh, and, and really began to set up a, an, an east-west divide in the, in the state of Washington, but really Oregon, I, I would, it, certain even elements of uh, Cal California and so forth, of on the one side in Washington state, you have top notch farming, nuclear power, you know, the, the various hydro and so forth. And then you have the invasion of the green uh, agenda. So what I would like to ask is on the question of bringing people together, what often comes up is, you know, from the people in eastern Washington, you want me to compromise with these people. And because that's what most people's idea of bipartisanship is, and is, is an idea of compromise. And, you know, with the, some of the recent developments in, in Washington state, the, the Death with Dignity Act, the, uh, the, the legalization of marijuana, you have now a, a real uh, showcase of where these guys want to take it, uh, Gates and company that have been behind some of this. Um, and, you know, somebody would say, how could I compromise with that? You know, my child, you want my child to engage in menticide with, you know, drugs, but or, or even just thinking through uh, this idea of the death with dignity that you're going to, you know, promote a culture of, a, of a, actually even a child having to deal with that kind of issue should, should grandma be killed, you know. So anyway, I just want to make this point on this question of bipartisanship where a lot of people see it as compromise. And uh, I'd like to know what your idea is on what, what it looks like in terms of, of actually bringing people together. Good. <clears throat> Well, first of all, there's no reason to compromise. No reason to compromise at all. If you compromise, you're doomed. You're dead. Or soon dead. The nation is soon dead. It's already dying. And what's happened is you have people who have, do no longer believe in the Constitution of the United States. They fight for changes which were considered illegal and justly so. They commit crimes against people, destroy their rights, pass legislation which destroys people's access to their lawful rights. No, we are not going to give in. We cannot give in. If we give in, the United States is dead. The time has come, either we change this now or we don't have a nation. Everything else will fail. However, look at it from the other side. If you can bring about a Glass-Steagall victory in the United States this year, going into September, you can reverse everything, not just by decree, but we will, we will do, those of us who have won the victory of Glass-Steagall, 
will enforce the victory of Glass-Steagall in terms of productivity. And we will create the jobs. We will create the higher paying jobs. And we will do it spontaneously. Why? Because we got Glass-Steagall. You've got states, the United States, the central states. They no longer produce food. The food that they would do produce is being turned into some kind of gasoline or something. There's not enough for people to live on in this food supply. So what you, 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 don't, you don't think in terms of counting people as if each people is a unit of ideas, a unit of policy. No. Society is influenced by a process which sweeps over and envelops the populations. And therefore, if you can get this country moving around its proper destiny, we run the country. We win the votes, we win the country. That doesn't mean we deprive other people of their rights, but mean we run the country. We win it, fair and square. And we do the things that are fair and square for the majority of citizens of the United States. And we give the people the encouragement needed to mobilize themselves, to get up and go. We do, at the same time, we say, we will not allow these swindlers in Detroit to do this. And if they spill over to adjoining states as well, we will not allow what happened to Pennsylvania in the recent period. We will not allow it. We are the majority. We have the law on our side. It is the real law. It's the Constitution of the United States. This other stuff is junk. And if we don't change the direction and get rid of the junk, the United States is not going to exist. You have no choice. Live with us or die. Not because we're going to kill you, but because you just plain die. Because you won't be fed. You won't have the opportunities. And that's the end of it. So that's the situation is that we have to we have to look at it. We have to take and realize that any body of citizens who has the right understanding, which means the tradition of our Constitution, and the kind of issues which have been characteristic of the United States in the best period of our existence. And just do it. Just do it again. And this time we're going, to, we're going to put in NOAPA, which is supposed to go into effect during the middle of the decade. We're going to do that. But that's not enough. That was, a, that was not based on nuclear power. This time, this time we're going to use the full throat of thermonuclear power and nuclear power in order to run a driver program for managing the water of all North America. Hmm? We will fix things by using the mightiest methods required to do what has to be done. And that you will find that a lot of the wimpy, wimpers and the dope smokers and so forth will just fall by the wayside because the time has come and the time has come for things are going to change. And the instant that we get glass steagall through, the change begins. All right, next I would like to ask Diane Sayre to come up to the podium to pose a question. Uh, Diane ran in the 2012 congressional campaign in New Jersey, and she she's at the heart of a very highly densely populated part of the country, and I think that people who have had the chance to, to work with her in that area have found that she is a, a, kind, of, a kind of magnet, or as a musician, I should, I should say more appropriately, when she sounds the certain note on the trombone, people heed the call. So I'd like uh, Diane to ask the next question. Well, this question in, is partly a continuation of what Dave was getting at. Um, as you know and we've discussed, 
uh, the question of what's happened to education in this country and what's being pushed under the Obama administration, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, ExxonMobil, Mark Zuckerberg, J.P. Morgan. And I think that the fight thus far to defeat it among the population generally is at too low of a level. That is, people object to particular things in the books, or they object to having biometric measuring instruments put on their children. All of this is highly objectionable. But what you said in your paper, um, I think, gets at the crux of the matter. And I just wanted to read this section, which makes it very clear. Uh, you write, the characteristic folly of whoever were the mere mathematician is most quickly demonstrated by an effort to assign a particular mathematical sort of value to the existence of an individual living human personality. Whereas the principle of classical drama deals well with such ironies, while those who are merely mathematicians, for the very reason of their choice of profession, are often moral illiterates in such specific subject matters. That is to be found flagrantly on Wall Street, for example. Only a special kind of illiterate, probably a vicious one, such as a typically malicious Wall Street money robot, could attempt to define the meaning of an actually living human personality by anything as dead as a mere number. And I think that is really the crux of the matter. And what I think would be extremely useful and helpful is if you could answer the question, what is an actual education which is worthy of a human being? Okay. Well, this is actually a big one. Big, a big one not because of the extent of the subject, because, but the depth of it. Yeah. For example, people will think that mathematics, or as applied in certain kinds of employment, of production and whatnot, uh, they think that's the acme of achievement. But that's not true. Because the acme of achievement has come from where? It's come from the p people like Nicholas of Cusa and, and his followers who actually created modern European civilization and also created the launching of what became the United States. And why did they create the United States? Or it wasn't known as the United States then. But Nicholas of Cusa, who died before this was accomplished, had nonetheless set into motion with his people, set a program which provided for moving people from Europe across the waters to a new territory because Nicholas understood, even he was a leader of the Renaissance, but he also understood that Europe was doomed. Why was it doomed? Because they had to move across the waters to get away from Europe in order to build up across the waters a civilization which would be capable of leading the people of Europe out of the dungeon, out of the out depths. And there was a gentleman called Christopher Columbus who became informed about the plan of Nicholas of Cusa. And this resulted in what became in net effect the United States, or the 17th century version of what was to become the United States, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So that what was the effect of this was that the emergence of the United States, beginning in the 17th century, through the Massachusetts Bay Colony, was a factor which affected like a shock all of Europe, especially Western and Central Europe. And that moved, in, that moved into being the conception of a new society, which was achieved under the 18th century as the United States. The world has hung for a long time, as the British know, with great pain. The Dutch have felt great pain, because the Dutch are dirtier than the British. And so what's happened is, 
the, the dirty ditch, the dirty Dutch and the dirty British have managed to pull something off for the destruction of the United States. What we've had is an invasion of the United States in particular from Europe, from the Queen of England, who is now determined and declared herself determined to reduce the human population on the planet from seven billion persons to less than one and to do it rapidly. That's what she's doing. All this talk about what the European policies are and so forth are nonsense. If you take the core of the empire, which there's a great amount of the total population of the world is in this empire. It's the Anglo-Dutch empire. And this evil empire is the major threat to all humanity and it's the threat to the United States. And it's those who came successfully from Europe, from British banking, from Wall Street banking. And Wall Street banking is nothing but British banking or British thievery. And we've allowed ourselves, by killing presidents who oppose such policies, by killing presidents, which they have done, they took the juice of the American spirit. And in that way, we were weakened and destroyed. This is our enemy, the British Anglo-Dutch Empire. Remember, the Anglo-Dutch Empire was established in the 17th century. And when the, when, the, when the Dutch family moved into England at the end of the 17th century, into the 18th century, that became the empire. And that is the empire which, which has dominated the world since that time, the Anglo-Dutch Empire. Not Dutch Empire, not British Empire, Anglo-Dutch Empire. That is the enemy. And it's the influence of that enemy which penetrates the United States, especially in cases like Wall Street. How many people in the United States of influence who are on the other side? Where do you find them? Where do you find the power to destroy the United States? the power that is destroying the United States, Wall Street, J.P. Morgan. That is the enemy. That's the agency of the British Empire, the enemy of the Anglo-Dutch Empire. And if we're going to get our nation back, if we're going to survive as a nation, we're going to pull down that enemy. That's what the problem is, and that's what the mission is. And that's what I'm committed to. Clean that mess up. And we could probably find that on the moon or some other piece of wreckage out there floating in space, we can probably dump the Anglo-Dutch nonsense and let it float off all by itself and we will not disturb it ever again. All right. Now, for the final question of the night, uh, the final formal question. I'm sure people will have a lot of other questions afterwards. I'd like Michael Steger to come up to the podium. And Michael Steger just recently had, uh, was a key organizer of the Schiller Institute Conference on the Second American Revolution, which was held in San Francisco uh, recently. And he's currently working with his colleagues to not only prevent California from falling off the map, but from turning it into a real golden state in the sense of Plato's golden soul. <laughs> so I'd like for Michael Steger to ask the final question of the evening. Thank you. So that's actually a good title for the question the Second American Revolution. Uh, our nation is approaching its uh, 400th year uh, of development. And in that process, um, there was a, a culmination in the previous century, uh, following World War II, of a development in California and the Western states where big challenges were confronted, uh, big land areas, and a certain basic um, policy was adopted. Bring water to the land, bring nuclear power, the most advanced energy source, to the area, 
and you see an explosion of human production, of scientific capabilities, of research that were unprecedented, which created the agricultural boom, the industry, and the scientific capabilities. And yet, California is nowhere near that today. Um, actually found out just recently that the California Aqueduct, the famous water canal project from the north to the south, was meant to be accompanied by 42 nuclear power plants. That would have been unprecedented and would have created a complete difference in California today. So something was missing because something has desperately gone wrong with California and the rest of the country and beckons a second American Revolution. In that light, you've written a recent paper, At the Brink of Mars. And at the end of that paper, you present a challenge based on essentially the 400 years, or perhaps more, maybe 600 or 3,000 years of human development, has essentially been limited. We've built some cities. We've built a few projects. We've even put a man on the moon. But in the scope of human potential, it's likely a limited, uh, a limited aspect of what may be done. And to the extent of what we do from this point forward in terms of our victory of this crisis today, we are limited, as you have developed it, uh, by a certain language that we must transcend to be effective at winning this current fight. And I would like you to... Um, perhaps elaborate more on that very vital conception. Well, I'm, what I'm working on is a prob eliminating something which should have been cleaned up a long time ago in terms of the conception of what man's condition and operation should be on this planet. We have not yet begun to understand what the potentiality of the human species is. This is something I'm working on. I'm in a new phase of it. It's been going on for some time. People in our so-called basement operation are quite familiar with this operation, which I'm in. It's just about, just recently, I launched the new phase of it, which this goes in phases where you have, because you always have to, uh, in these matters, you have to make clear what you're talking about. And that sometimes takes some time and some preparation on various people, even the participants in the effort. So therefore you have to go through these steps where each step of realization of what this means becomes clearer. Now obviously we've been working, for example, on Mars. Mars is one of my big projects, but it's not a Mars project as most people would think it is. It's quite different. But the point is that mankind has got to realize that living on this planet Earth in the way we live now imposes limitations upon us which are not good for the future. For ex there are many aspects to this thing, and I'm working on more and more of this. I know what I'm going to say, but in a matter like this, when you're dealing with a scientific question of this nature, you can't say everything all run and off as a spiel all at one time. You have to go through the steps of defining what you mean, what somebody else will not understand that you mean, et cetera, et cetera. And we've, I've got a live thing in my hand right now, which is very important and satisfies me greatly, but it dissatisfies me because I know it's going to take more time than I have right now to get the job done. But the point is, we as mankind have to understand that we're not people living like flies or something on Earth, on planet Earth. We, we have an implicit mission which we cannot identify, but we know it's there. We know that mankind cannot simply live the way we think mankind has lived. But there are too many problems coming out there in the solar system itself. Now, our, limit, our ability to live on other planets nearby is highly limited, but we can live on those planets, live, that live off them. We can be involved in, in operations which involve those other planets. Mars is the most obvious one. You know? we, can, we, may not, we never, may never have a significant population on Mars. Never. I wouldn't even recommend it. Certainly not now. We have none of the preconditions necessary to set up a, a Mars 
human Mars habitation on them at all. That's, a, that's down the line. It depends on a very high rate of development, of economic development, physical economic development. We're nowhere near that right now. Maybe in two generations, or, you know, each, each of, of 25 years of younger people coming in 25 years, 25 years. It was four, four generations per century. On that basis, by the somewhere between the uh, third and fourth century, we should be able to do something on something like Mars. But to have people actually living and working on there is a different problem. But the point is we, we face precisely in man's existence, we face these kinds of issues, such as the issues Im implicit for us in the inner section of the planets of the solar system now. And that's a mission we have to do. Not because the mission is going to give people now an immediate benefit of the, such projects, but it means it's going to give our people the inspiration to build their way to conducting such successful projects. It's think when you can think in terms of a century. Now, I'm almost a century person. I'll be this, in a, well, let's see, I'll be 91 years of age, not this month, but after next month. I'm, so, uh, so I'm almost a century person. Huh? So therefore, I, my experience is largely almost a century in duration. I'm a century man. My loyalties are there. That is to my duty. And from that standpoint, and the experience that this involves for me, I remember. I have four generations of experience under me, virtually. And I remember. I remember places, people, circumstances, incidents, wars, all these things. And they all come clattering down the chute toward me. And so I think that mankind, if we want to define what the human being is and what a human mission is, we have to think in terms of prospectively living a century of four generations, huh? four adult generations, 25 years each. And that should be the goal which every person has, however long they live, even two centuries or three. And we need, we need people who will agree to think and act in those terms of reference. And by that devotion to that purpose of living, they transform the population from people who wander around like straight bumps through society, who have no long-term purpose for their existence, who have only the pleasures that they have in the short term of their life, and they just plan to go ahead and die on us, leaving us behind with no significant achievement to contribute to the future of mankind. And yet I know, as others have known, as Nicholas Acuza knew, as, you know, so forth. We have known this, that the greatest incentive to be a human being is to be immortal. Not immortal in the flesh, but immortal in terms of the consequences of one's existence. And to be part of, a, of, of generations of, of families who pass that dedication on from each of them to whatever generations come after them. And it's only that kind of principled outlook on life which is an adequate stimulant and devotion for dealing with the essential problem of the human species. That so far the human species has never really succeeded in truly becoming human. And that's what we mean by immortality. Not that you're going to live out your life, this life eternally, but what you're going to do in it is going to have an immortal effect to the benefit of coming to generations.
Well, that uh, brings a conclusion to our special event for tonight. I would like to thank the entire policy committee for joining us here in the studio um, for uh, making this a special event that we held. And uh, I would like to thank Leandra. I would like to thank Mr. LaRouche. And I would like to thank all of you watching. Uh, good night, and we'll see you again.